Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Now, if you're anything like me, the first thing you do when you enter a new room is probably clap your hands, right? Obviously, to check what the reverb time is like, just to get an idea of the sound and the space, and probably to listen out for a flutter echo. The other day I was even tempted to clap my hands when I went to a friend's concert. She sings in a choir and they performed in a big concert hall. And when I entered this space and saw all the treatment on the wall, the first thing I wanted to do was just kind of stand there and clap and listen out. But obviously with everybody entering and the kind of mood, I felt really out of place. So it was more of a like a kind of a sitting down and kind of going but actually, flutter echo is a really distinct problem, and you need to test it right in order to assess if you actually have a problem. And so that's what I want to talk about in this video. But before I do that, there's obviously way more that goes into actually figuring out the treatment for your studio. And if you're in the process of treating your studio, if you're just setting up a new studio, I want to help you out with my home studio treatment framework that you can download completely for free at the link in the description. These are my five steps to systematically treating a room and getting it to translate. So it's all in there, how to set up your listening position and speakers, how to think about porous absorption, how to think about measurements, speaker equalization, resonance absorption, setting up a subwoofer, speaker decoupling. It's all in there, nicely laid out for you in a step-by-step -step process so you know what to focus on and what you can ignore at each step of the way because it's so easy to just end up turning in circles doing things that you should have done way before and now you have to kind of wind back and start all over again because you missed a crucial step at the beginning i don't want that to be you so if you're setting up a studio if you're in the process of treating your home studio, make sure you're on the right path, get that top level perspective of what it is you're doing, in which direction you're heading, what to focus on next by downloading my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. But getting back to the clap test, what are we trying to actually achieve by clapping our hands? Well, usually one of the first things we're trying to do is to get a sense of the space. And that kind of involves what it sounds like, what it feels like, but more precisely also the reverb time. Now, one of the problems with the clap test is that clapping your hands is actually really focused on mid frequencies and high frequencies, really. So if I load up the real time analyzer, for example, here in Room EQ Wizard, and I show you what frequency response the clap gives us, now this is a very rudimentary test because what we really want to do is actually remove the impact that the speakers and the room has on our clap but that you can't do with a real-time analyzer in any case let's just check and see what the response is like right so you can see here that the most energy is kind of centered in the in the mids somewhere between, let's say, 500 and 2 kilohertz. And then it seems to kind of decay a bit in the top end, at least in this measurement. But there is some low end in here. It's just that it isn't very pronounced. So if you do a clap test to check the reverb time in a room, just know that you're really only hearing the response in the mids and highs. You can't really use it to check the low end, the effect any room modes have in that space. But really quickly, what we tend to focus on is flutter echo, right? I mean, that's one of the main things we do when we get into a room is we find some spot in the middle of the room, we clap our hands and we listen out for that ring, that distinct zing that you get from flutter echoes. So what is a flutter echo? Well, it's a particular kind of echo. Yeah? Just imagine a room where just one wall is purely reflective. All the other ones are absorptive, so you're only getting a reflection from that one wall. So if you clap your hands, that sound will travel to that wall, reflect back, and then get absorbed on the other side. And if you're standing in that path, in that direct path of the reflection, you'll basically hear an echo from your clap if that wall is far enough away. Now, if the, the opposite wall is also fully reflective, 
the sound will start bouncing back and then continue on bouncing between these two walls. And depending on how far they are apart, these two walls, it'll take more or less time for the echo to travel that distance. If the distance is small enough, it'll travel fast enough that we won't be able to distinguish individual echoes. And that's basically when it turns into that zing or that ring. This is when the travel time involved between these two walls in, in between individual reflections arriving at your ear is within the Haas zone. So typically below 25 milliseconds. Yeah? And then our brains can't keep these individual reflections apart. It can't tell them apart and it'll actually hear a tone. Yeah, And that's what creates that zing or ring. But if that distance between individual echoes is larger than the Haas zone, so typically larger than 25 milliseconds, you'll actually be able to hear individual reflections. And that's when it turns into more of an, an echo, a flutter echo, where you can actually hear the individual kind of pings. Of course, both are pretty annoying in a studio setting, right? If it's in the Haas zone and you're actually hearing that zing, that'll basically have the effect of coloration on the direct sound. So think primarily a distortion of the frequency response, a coloration, and also if you're, if you're talking about a stereo image, you'll basically get image shift or a, you lose detail in, and precision in the stereo sound field in the sound stage. And if it actually causes distinct echoes, just think about how annoying that will be, how distracting that is if your brain is trying to actually hear the direct sound from the speakers and now it has to distinguish that from this echo bouncing around between the two walls to your left and right. Here's the thing though, to create a flutter echo, the location of the source and the receiver, aka you clapping your hands or the speaker and your ear, is really, really crucial because the flutter echo, the, the echo only happens on a direct 90 degree line between these parallel walls. If you deviate from that, typically more than about three feet or a meter, then you can't actually get a flutter echo or you won't be in the path of the flutter echo and so you won't be able to perceive it. So if the source, your hands or the speaker, and the receiver, your ears are further apart than about three feet or a meter, flutter echo isn't actually a problem. And that also means that if there is a stretch of parallel walls in your studio, for example, that isn't where your source and receiver are located, then even if you could theoretically get a flutter echo between those, those two walls, it still isn't a problem because that's not where your source and receiver are located. And that's, for example, the case here in my studio with the section of untreated wall that you can see behind me. And that is where you're probably going wrong with your clap test. Because if you are clapping your hands, your hands and your ear will definitely be within three feet. And if there are parallel walls around you, you will create a flutter echo. But that doesn't actually tell you whether that is a problem for when you sit in your listening position and your speakers are playing. Because flutter echo is so dependent on the exact location of the source and the receiver, we need to be more strategic about how we test for flutter echo in order to actually tell if it's going to cause a problem. So in practice, when does it actually appear? How do we test for it and how do we remove it? Well, I can think of only two scenarios where it actually causes a problem, and I kind of hinted at one already. The first one is that you have a mixing setup, speakers and listening position, in an untreated room between parallel walls, and your speakers are actually fairly close. So it's a small stereo mixing setup with your speakers within three feet of your ears. Now, the way to test for a flutter echo problem in that scenario is to not clap your hands, because again, that'll be too close to your ears. What you want to do is play a single clap through one or both of your speakers and then listen out if it creates any flutter echo. And if it does, because it's a mid to high frequency issue, it's actually easy enough, in theory at least, to get rid of it with just 
two inches, kind of five centimeters of porous absorption. So typically foam or insulation material. Now, quick note here, if you've been watching my channel for any amount of time, then you probably know that I still don't recommend you do that because we're trying to use that real estate on the wall for more than just getting rid of flutter echoes. And specular reflections in particular also go beyond just the effect or just causing flutter echoes. So just because there is a flutter echo and you got rid of the flutter echo, it doesn't mean that there aren't remaining issues that you still need to take care of by treating the side walls. And that typically requires deeper absorption. On top of that, if you're thinking room modes, those need actual base trapping. So much deeper absorption because we're talking about absorbing very low frequencies. So just because you can get rid of flutter echo with fairly shallow absorption doesn't mean that you should use shallow absorption because you're actually trying to do way more with that usable space on your sidewalls. The second scenario is close miking instruments or performers. Obviously, if you're recording a vocalist, for example, the microphone is typically pretty close. And if you've got untreated parallel walls around your performer, it is very possible that you will get the effect of flutter echo in your recordings. Same goes for close miking cabs for guitars and bass, for example. And so this is actually the only instance where a clap test might actually be viable, right? So if you know exactly where your performer is going to be, if you know exactly where you're going to place your microphone, you can then simply clap your hands where your microphone is going to be while standing in the position of your performer and then listen out for flutter echo. And in that particular case, <laughs> the results are actually valid. And again, because it's a mid and high frequency problem, two inches of porous absorption on the offending flat surfaces will probably be enough to get rid of that problem. But Again, because you're trying to do more with the available space than just get rid of flutter echoes, I still highly recommend that you think about deeper absorption if you can sacrifice the space. So here's what I want you to take away from this video. Feel free and continue clapping your hands when you go into new rooms. I'm definitely not gonna stop you. I will probably continue doing the same as well. It is fun, it is interesting, it is insightful. Just be aware of the limitations. If you're checking for reverb time, for the decay of the space, know that you can really only tell what's going on in the mid and high frequencies. It won't tell you anything about the low end. And if you're checking for flutter echoes, you clapping your hands and listening out for it is really only a valid test for a scenario where you're close miking your performer or your instruments. That's the only case where the results of clapping your, your hands actually tell you something about what you'll hear in the recordings. But if you want to check whether your speakers are giving you flutter echo at your listening position, you're much better off simply playing a clap through the speakers and then listening out for the response. In any other scenario, clapping your hands and then making some sort of judgment call on flutter echo is probably you just fooling yourself about a problem that doesn't exist. All right, with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.